Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Greylock's at Conversations. I'm Reid Hoffman, a general partner at Greylock and your host for today's event. I am thrilled to welcome James Manika as our guest today. James is the newly appointed SVP of Technology and Society at Google, a role he has taken on following more than 27 years at McKinsey Global, where he advised leaders at many of the top tech companies of, in the world. James has focused on artificial intelligence, robotics, and globalization for his entire career. And he's had extensive experience in pretty much every type of workplace imaginable, from academia to government agencies, to private companies and nonprofits. His contributions range from books and articles to speeches, lectures, and of course, countless moments of critical advice in top secret capacities. He's held several government advisory posts including as vice chair of the Global Development Council under the Obama administration, and he was named to the Digital Economy Board and National Innovation Board. He also serves on the board of the Council of Foreign Relations and recently co-chaired the State of California's Future of Work Commission. Today, he serves in various science and technology capacities, including as a distinguished fellow of Stanford's Human-Centered AI Institute, fellow and visiting professor at Oxford, board member at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, among others. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicines Committee on Responsible Computing. He's also a great friend of mine who I've shared many incredible initiatives and experiences, including our recent trip to the South Pole, where uh, I believe James was the first Zimbabwean-born uh, visitor uh, to the geographic South Pole. Uh, a note to our audience, you can ask questions using the chat function on your screen. We'll address them towards the end of the discussion today. James, as always, thank you for being with us today. You've had a long and busy career through one of the fastest changing periods in our history. And to this day, you are constantly expanding your exploration zone, not just to the South Pole. Um, welcome. Well, th th thank you, Reid. I'm excited to do this with you. It's always fun to, to be in conversations with you. So, um, you, we were at Oxford together, but didn't know each other then. Uh, you've been focused on artificial intelligence uh, and robotics for your entire career, including then, uh, from the technical aspects to the ethical aspects, um, which obviously, you know, super important for designing, implementing, uh, founding the technology. What set you off on this course? Well, th th thanks for asking the question. In fact, it's, you know, apart from growing up watching all the, you know, science fiction films, 2001 A Space Odyssey and everything, uh, I had a very peculiar thing happen on as an, an undergraduate in Zimbabwe. So I was looking for a, an, an undergraduate research project, and it turns out that a postdoc was visiting from Canada. Uh, this postdoc had been one of Jeff Hinton's students, actually. So he said, well, why don't you do a project building a neural network? And I said, what is that? So that was actually the first time I ever actually pro programmed a neural network, as some of uh, your audience will know. Jeff Hinton was among one of the people who actually pioneered the, you know, the, the successful run we've had now with uh, uh, deep learning and neural networks. So that was how I got started. So from that, I got hooked, uh, went to Oxford. Uh, at Oxford, I, you know, I did a few different things, but when I finished, I'd done a uh, doctorate in AI and robotics. Uh, and that was, a, that was a fascinating time. At the time, by the way, uh, there was often a reluctance to call this AI because of the you know, previous period of AI winter. So we actually called it machine perception, machine learning, and other things, anything but AI. Exactly. And um, one doesn't normally go from a PhD in machine learning, machine perception to McKinsey. Um, what, was, what, was the, um, what was that that move? And in particular, of course, you know, and we'll get into this in, in some depth, you know, kind of thinking about societal and economic ecosystems as part of this. Well, it was a very accidental thing for me, Reed, because part of it was quite frankly an excuse to be in California uh, because when McKinsey made me an offer, uh, I could be in California. And I'd been spending some time, by the way, uh, even after my PhD at Jet Propulsion Labs when I was in the uh, visiting scientist in the Man Machine Systems Group because some of the things I worked on my doctorate were applicable then. And besides, a few friends of mine had this crazy idea that we might actually build an autonomous car. 
So well, my other friend was at Berkeley and we're working with Stuart Russell and others. So I said, well, maybe, you know, this McKinsey thing is an excuse to be in California, be in Bay Area. So I actually took a leave of absence uh, from the other stuff that I was doing just as an excuse to be in the Bay Area. And I guess I ended up staying. But, but, but more seriously, though, I think part of what I learned at the time was that I was fascinated by very large scale problems. Uh, and of course, technology is a big part of that. But also just think about large scale societal questions was what fascinated me. And McKinsey seemed to be a, a great platform and place to do that, particularly at the Global Institute, where I ended up leading the Global Institute for, uh, for many years. Yep. Well, then the Global Institute is obviously, you know, producing a huge amount of very interesting and very uh, kind of practical is not on the wrong word, but but rooted in what kinds of things to do and what trends are happening. And so that that makes sense. Um, so what uh, what's this new role at Google? Right. Like what what what, oh. what are you going to be doing? <laughs> well, th th thank you. But it almost feels like a continuation of the things that I've been passionate about, Reed, in the sense that, uh, you know, it's it has this big title technology and society. But what we what, what it's really about is to really think about what are all these advanced technologies going to mean for uh, society in the best sense, right? In the sense of what opportunities will be created, what things do you want to make sure we manage well. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time doing research, uh, spending time with uh, the amazing AI teams at, at Google, Jeff and Demis and others, and also, you know, think about the next generation of bets and investments and how those might affect uh, uh, society. And quite frankly, talking to a lot of people uh, inside Google, outside of Google, and trying to engage in these issues around technology and society. I, you know, you and I have spent a lot of time thinking about how do we make sure all of this, how do we get it right? Uh, how, how can we make sure that things go right? And I'm particularly excited about making sure in an, in an area like AI and robotics, where I've spent most of my time, I want to make sure it, it turns out right. Yep. So one of the things that you have um, coming up is uh, through the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, where both you and I are members, you have, they have a magazine, a, 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 thought, a very thoughtful set of um, issues, Daedalus. You have an AI issue coming up. What are some of, to, to kind of begin to dig into these issues and some of the things that obviously you've been doing at McKinsey and we'll be doing at Google, what are some of the issues that you're going to be addressing in that, in that issue of Daedalus? And what are some of the things that you think because I think we're probably broadly more talking to technologists here that that technologists should be thinking about as they uh, as they think about this amazing technology, this renaissance we're going in an AI, which we will obviously dig into. Well, first of all, I was so excited when the American Academy asked me about a year and year ago to curate and edit this special edition of Deadless. Normally, when Deadless comes out, it is like eight essays. Uh, but this one's going to have 27 essays. And what's fun about that is I was able to arm twist uh, my friends and people I know. So I've got everybody contributing an essay from, you know, Jeff Dean as an essay, Kevin Scott at Microsoft as an essay, uh, Mira Murati from OpenAI as an essay, uh, Stuart Russell from Berkeley. So you've got to half the contributors are sort of AI pioneers and people who really work in the frontier of the technology. The other half are people who are thinking about the implications on society. So they have got people like Eric Brynjolfsson, an economist, Michael Spence, a Nobel laureate, uh, philosophers and ethicists. So this issue is actually called AI and society. But if you if I come to your question, read about, you know, where are we uh, in this? I think on the technical side, it, it's a very exciting time. I mean, your audience will know and the participants will know that We've had an incredible run with techniques like deep learning and reinforcement learning, and especially in deep learning now, you know, you got a turbocharge recently with the, you know, development of transformer models. So these systems are working remarkably well. One of the debates you'll hear in the, in the collection, and it's very much in the community, is, you know, are the current approaches sufficient to get us to remarkably powerful AI or even ultimately artificial general intelligence. So this is one of the debates in the field, which is, are these techniques and approaches enough? And if you take a room of AI people, half, the, half them will say, oh yeah, this is all we need. Uh, and if you talk to the other half, will say, well, this stuff is great, but we need so much more. Uh, and usually what they're getting at there is 
there's still some very hard problems in AI. Uh, they range from things like how do we do, can we actually do causal reasoning with these systems? Can we get to issues of meaning? Uh, can we do transfer learning? Uh, can we do what, you know, Daniel Kahneman and others have described as system two tasks. So there's still some very hard problems. And the debate is, are these techniques enough or are we going to need other things? By the way, that debate is typically when you ask people about AGI, about how far away is it? Much of that debate hinges on this question. So the people who think we've got all the tools and techniques will say, oh, no, it's very, very close. The people who don't think we've got enough will say, no, 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 we still need some major conceptual additional breakthroughs before we can get there. This is one of the fun debates, and you'll see this in the, uh, in the, in the, in the collection, at least on the technical question. Now, of course, mm. there are other questions that are being debated in the edition, I'm sure we'll get into about some of the societal issues, the economic jobs implications, uh, the fun topic you and I have fun with all the time, great power competition. Right. How do you think about how this plays out on the global stage? But it, yep. it's, it's going to be a pretty broad, uh, fascinating discussion. It mirrors what's going on well, in the community, by the way. Yeah, let's use that as an initial uh, discourse, because one of the things I think sometimes gets lost in this discourse is you say, well, look, there's two camps. One thinks that AGI is, you know, 10, 20, 30 years in the future, and there's always this little betting pool of, you know, what, where, where do you get to 20% or 50% or 80% as a chance in number of years? And you and I both run that little, little, little opening poll question in group in room and groups of rooms. But even if you don't get to AGI, the transformative impact of, you know, this, this new renaissance in AI is going to be huge. Um, say a little bit about kind of what you see as coming, even if you don't get to AGI, we'll, we'll get to another thing on AGI. And what are some of the kind of societal questions that technology should be thinking about and part of, you know, we as a broader broader discourse. So like kind of like what's, what's possible, even with just, you know, machine learning as it is. And then what are some of the important questions for us to address? Yeah, no, I, I think that, so, so, so first of all, there's just the economics of it. So one of the things that is actually truly exciting is the amazing transformational potential of these technologies to economic growth and prosperity. And one of the things, that, a quick way to see that is, uh, you know, just a, you know, 30 seconds of kind of uh, economic theory. So if you look at how the economy grows, uh, people got Nobel prizes for this. There's something called, you know, growth disaggregation that Bob Sol and others got. So you get GDP growth by either getting productivity growth and labor supply growth. You put those together, GDP growth. Now, for you know, with aging and other things, much of our forward-looking economic growth is going to come from productivity growth. And at the core of productivity growth is technological innovation. And at this point in time, AI and related technologies have extraordinary potential to transform how productivity growth happens. So in that macro sense, we need it for the economy and economic growth. You come back to a much more practical level. We did some research uh, with you know, friends at Google and Microsoft and a few others to look at use cases in the economy. So coming down from the lofty kind of economic theory level, you come down to actual use cases. And if you look at these techniques in the next, you know, we looked at the initial where we looked at something like 400 use cases. Now that library has gone up to where we now have thousands of use cases. What you find is that the powerful economically compelling and commercial use cases are actually there in every sector of the economy. So this is not just something in the tech sector, but it's everywhere. And the biggies, by the way, are in retail and transportation and logistics, just from a sheer view of applicable use cases. And it's not just a sectoral question, it's also a functional question. Sales and marketing is actually one of the biggest arenas. Uh, supply chain and logistics, if you think about it as, as a function inside companies. So the use cases are there everywhere. In fact, when we first tried to size this read, just looking at the available, what looked like the realistic use cases, we got to a number that was at least uh, $6 trillion uh, potentially annually in the near term. And if you scale that up to all the other use cases that are emerging, the numbers get bigger and bigger. So in, in a nutshell, the economic possibilities and potential, both for the economy, for businesses and companies are tremendous. Now, the other question that comes up, of course, that uh, uh, is an implication even before we get to AGI, 
tends to be the question about jobs and labor markets. Uh, and this, this is where the story is a bit mixed uh, in the following sense. So while the economic case is clear, the jobs labor markets question is a bit mixed. It's mixed in the sense that we've done lots of studies as have others too. And generally what most of those studies conclude is that uh, first of all, don't worry about a jobless future, at least not for the next several decades, because what will happen is we're going to lose some jobs, but we're also going to gain some jobs. But the biggest effect is that most jobs will change. So, but what will happen, therefore, is even though the, you know, we have jobs for the future, the question is how do we deal with the transitions? And the transition issues here have to do with reskilling, with occupational changes, uh, with the, some of the wage effects. And these are the things that we're really going to need to navigate and think through quite carefully. But for the most part, don't worry about a jobless future, at least not for the next few decades. So that's the economic, the labor market question tends to be a little bit more complex and so we can uh, discuss that some more. Now, there are other effects people think about. These are the societal, ethical, and other questions, and I'm sure we'll get into those. But, you know, because these transformational technologies have a way how we use them, the questions of use and misuse, questions of the second order effect when it comes to things like information, disinformation, deep fakes, etc. There's a whole other set of implications that we have to think about. It gets to questions of governance, use and misuse. Then, of course, we get to your, one of your favorite topics, Reid, which is just what, how does this play out in terms of great power competition? We know that already two countries are racing ahead, uh, ahead of everybody. That's the United States and China. Others are not quite, uh, you know, progressing at the same pace. So how does, what does this all mean when you've got so much economics at stake, uh, but also uh, these national security and geopolitical strategic interests at stake? That's another whole question and arena uh, for this field. Yep, I totally agree, obviously, given the number of conversations we've had. I mean, I think part of the frame of this is for folks to realize that even though there's been a lot of drum rolling and as yet relatively modest industrial impact from the AI stuff, as the software trans, uh, transitions both into the kind of what, one of the frequent expressions I use, the world of bits and atoms, we're going to see some, some particularly... Uh, uh, massive uh, changes. And, you know, it'll probably be a little bit more surprising and a little sooner than we think. Um, it isn't, you know, some things will obviously, you know, like, for example, jobs, I think will stay, um, the jobs will transform, but there will be jobs. Um, it's just the transformation, as you say. Um, one of the things that um, is obviously, I think, part of what makes everyone nervous about the AI technology is the explainability, is the transparency, you know, kind of problem, which is the what is this device doing? So maybe this device will drive the vehicle, but like, will it make sure that it, it will drive it safely? And do you know it? And how do you get a sense of it given how complicated, you know, hundreds of billions of parameters in these transformer models? Um, do you see kind of how you, how can you bring other people into the discourse and how do you get other people to get some confidence about what's happening? Um, you know, how to, how to put those two elements together? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a, that's an important question, Reed, because I think, you know, despite, you know, our collective exuberance about these technologies, there are some major limitations and, as I said, some hard problems. But I think on the it's worth dwelling a little bit on the limitations and gaps before we get to the truly hard mm -hmm. uh, AI problems. I think the limitations includes uh, are the, much, most of them have to do with the things that are likely to erode public trust. Uh, and a lot of those include things like, uh, you know, bias in algorithms or in the data or the corpora that are used to train them. Questions about brittleness, uh, for example, in the systems. It, this issue of when you, when you have, uh, you know, out of band distributional non-stationarities, for example, when you, you know, when you train the data sets on, this, on these set of things and then you suddenly present them something out of distribution, it makes different predictions. Uh, and, and also the issue of explainability, because from a trust building standpoint, now, Often, what, what I often find interesting, Reed, is that often people who don't understand the technology outside the tech industry think that the tech industry is trying to hide something on explainability. No, it's just that the neural network structure, the structure of these algorithms are such that you can't actually open it up 
and say it made this decision because of this particular variable, that particular variable, or this data set, although we're starting to get better at that. So the question is, how do we address these limitations and gaps that are likely to erode public trust? And I think it's important to keep public trust in these systems, because if these systems are going to show up in health applications, in autonomous vehicles, etc., people need to understand and be trustful of these systems. So there's a now how we get to that, I think there's a lot more research and work to be done. And I think some of that is underway. I think we're starting to make progress on that front. But also, I think having the public keep up with the field and understand how these systems work. There's a lot of education, a lot of involvement uh, and participation in the processes that are going to have to. But this is one of the things we have to get right. We have to continue to build public trust in these systems and be quite open and transparent about what we know and what we don't know. So those are some of these limitations we need to work through, despite, in, in addition to all the hard other problems we still have to work on. There's a lot of work to do. And by the way, one of the, I should have mentioned, one of the other, uh, these trust eroding limitations are some of the uh, toxic outputs from sometimes for these algorithms, which happen not all of the time, but some of the time. So this is one of the criticisms, for example, of large language models. I'm sure we'll get to talk about large language models, but that's been one of the criticisms that occasionally you'll get sexist uh, or racist outputs from these systems. Uh, we need to fix that. But that that's, you know, that's one of the these trust eroding issues with these systems. Yeah, fortunately, every let's let's go to the large language models and 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 and, you know, kind of which is one of the areas that generating it. and every right. every group that I know that's working on them is now very focused on questions like uh, racial bias and, um, you know, alignment and safety questions, um, right. in part because they kind of reflect the data that's there. And it is, right. to some degree, a partial Rorschach test on our society, but also, of course, also on where the data is. It's a little bit like kind of classically in the criminal justice system, one of the reasons why an algorithm that goes across the data set that's reported captures the fact that that you know over the last decades police forces have have more policed you know the communities of color than they have others and so they have all the data that then gets enshrined and it's one of the things you have to be really careful about in things like risk and and parole and credit and other kinds of things that are that are super important and i think one of the really good things is everyone now goes yep <laughs> that's we're, we're yeah, doing no, something on in it in fact yeah, and, and in fact, I think one of the things about these issues of bias, which have showed up in, yes, as you said, in criminal justice system, in financial lending, and in uh, hiring, uh, for example, often the issues with data and often the issues how that data is collected and often the issues actually not with the algorithms, quite frankly, but rather how society has set itself up to gather this data. And policing is a good example because we know, for example, there's, uh, you know, greater police presence in uh, in certain neighborhoods and places. So more data is collected. So are you surprised, therefore, when predictions are made from areas where there's they heavily, uh, where there's a lot of data is being collected that will make certain predictions? Of course not. Uh, similarly, you see it on the other end of the spectrum in financial lending, where if you've got people, where it's the opposite problem, where if you've got people who are quote unquote off the financial grid, often algorithms make bad predictions about, uh, you know, uh, whether they're worth lending to or not. Whereas people for whom we know a lot about, we tend to make better predictions about. So these questions about how society itself captures the data is as much an issue as it is the, for the algorithms. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't think about ways to spot that in the algorithms and how we curate the data we should. But quite often, these systems are actually highlighting our issues, quite frankly, I mean, one of the fun things is, you know, on this fairness and bias, you may, I think you saw this paper read where some, you know, some AI researchers tried to say, okay, so please society, give us a definitions of fairness so we can actually build algorithms that do that. And I think in that paper, they identified 21 different definitions of fairness. Uh, so how do you even create algorithms for that? I think so these systems are actually forcing us as society to really ask ourselves some really hard questions. I don't think we've ever fully defined fairness. I was actually at an interesting symposium with, uh, uh, which was 
included, uh, you know, AI researchers, sociologists, and lawyers and philosophers. And the general conclusion, by the way, in that discussion was of the form, you know, society, we've never really defined fairness. We tend to have to use two proxies for it. One proxy that we use is to say, well, you know, we, what, what you might call procedural fairness. So in other words, if something's gone through this process, we'll assume it's fair, right? Just because it's gone through this process, we'll take the output as fair. Or we'll say what's sometimes referred to as compositional fairness. We'll say, okay, if this group of people made the hiring decisions, we'll accept what they say because the group is made up of these people, this particular composition. But you notice in both cases, we've not really defined what the actual fair outcome looks like. We've defined a process that we take as fair, or we've defined a composition to make the decision that we think is fair. So in other words, we're still ducking the question, what does fair look like? Yeah, well, and obviously part of the challenge and fairness, which is the reason why that excellent paper, which I think I got, I first read because you sent it to me, um, was, you know, it's somewhat political and human groups conflict. And they say, well, I want this definition of fairness because it's better for me. I want this definition of fairness because it's better for me. And it's part of the reason why these things are always, always uh, complicated. What is some of the best ideas that you're seeing for how to deal with you know, kind of call it broadly, these corrections of societal biases. Because I think one of the things you and I share, although we've been in groups that don't have this point of view, um, is that, look, one of the benefits of putting this in an AI system is we can fix it. We can, we can, make, we can make the system better. So you go, well, okay, it's uh, current software algorithmic systems are doing bad things when they uh, are making parole recommendations or when they're making financial credit decisions. Uh, they're doing so in part because of just the data that's there. What are some of the things that you're seeing that are like, okay, this could be a good fix because then we could make society better because we fix this underlying bias that might've been there anyway. Um, and so as opposed to being in, institutionalized by the new AI software system, it can be improved. What is, what is some, of, some of the ideas that you're seeing that are the best things to implement on that? Yeah, so, so a few things, but, but first of all, just to note, you know, acknowledge the, uh, the, the, the reason, there's a good reason why people are concerned about algorithms in this sense, because even though they have the potential to have, to do a lot of good, they tend to be what some have called formalizers and amplifiers, because if you, if you get the algorithm wrong, you're going to, in, in you, you're going to deploy it at scale and you're going to bake it in. And so the effects in some ways may be much worse than a single biased judge, when in fact the whole system of judges are now relying on the system. So this question of formalization and amplification is a legitimate concern. But to your question about what are some of the ways that are getting at these things, I think there's some very cool technical work that's going on where people are building ways to actually examine data sets and actually spot structural biases in the data sets themselves. Uh, there's some very, um, uh, some terrific work that some researchers, Sylvia Chiapa being one of them, that are doing on things like counterfactual fairness, which is how do you actually build, you know, if you like, competing algorithms that actually try to understand and do counterfactuals on the data to say, if we took this part out, could we have made a different prediction if we take this part out? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine having AIs actually help with that problem is actually one of the clever ways to actually spot the biases in the system. So I'm actually excited about that kind of work that's going on. But I think the other part is just actually, you know, you know, uh, having different kinds of people be involved in the process. So one of the things that uh, 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 I've been involved in, I think you mentioned at the beginning, there's a, the National Academies of uh, uh, Science, Engineering, and Medicine put together this committee that I've been on, on responsible computing. And you suddenly realize that one of the things that happens is you need people to ask the right questions. Uh, you need people to actually understand, uh, you know, ask the right questions, having different multidisciplinary people, diversity, especially in a disciplinary sense, uh, who can actually ask the counterfactuals in the development process. That can make a big, that can actually make a big difference. I, I should point out though, by the way, Reed, that one of the other fun debates, by the way, uh, uh, in the field is much like there's a fun debate about you know, are these techniques sufficient or not? The other debate has to do with uh, approaches to developing these systems in the following sense. There's, there's one camp that feels 
we can correct and improve these systems if we put them out into the world and have people use them and capture the errors, et cetera. So if we do that at scale, having real people use them, that's the way to improve them. The other camp says, no, 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 no. We need to test and test and test and test and test and test before we deploy anything. So you're seeing this play out uh, in the real world, even in approaches to autonomous vehicles, for example, uh, where one school of thought is put them out into the real systems and we'll learn. Others say, no, 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 keep you know, doing training runs and training runs. So this is one of the questions and appro competing approaches to this question of how do we get these systems right? Yep, I, I completely agree. Um, one of the things you gestured at earlier, and this has obviously been in the dialogue um, for a number of years, um, obviously played to your California's Future Work Commission, was you know, there's a there's a general, the Silicon Valley folks tend to go, oh my God, the future is going to be here right away. So like, for example, we're going to have, right. this isn't yet getting to AGI, this is the fourth transformation of right. work. They tend to say, oh my God, you know, it's like a Star Trek future, robots are going to be generating everything, you know, we need universal basic income, jobs are going away, et cetera, et cetera. Say a little bit about the actual work you've done looking at this, what the, um, uh, what the actual the actual shape of the next few decades look like, so that we can predict and intervene in ways that are good for society, whether it's building the technology, understanding uh, policy. But like, what does that future of work look like? Yeah, no, I think this is where we've got some really hard questions. I mean, the commission you're pointing to this was a this was an interesting arrangement. So I was co-chairing the the commission with uh, my co-chair was. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, she's an extraordinary uh, leader of one of the largest labor unions. And on the commission itself, we had, uh, you know, business, uh, people from the labor, people from academia. So it was a very, you know, technologists and others. I mean, Fei Fei Lee was on it. So it was a very diverse group. And when you look at these questions about the future of work, I think I would, I'd, I'd pass the issues in a few categories. One is the issue around just the fact, the reskilling. The reskilling one's an important one because we know that jobs are changing. Um, many more jobs will change than will be lost, actually. So having people be able to adapt and keep up with those changes is a really large problem. And in fact, one of the issues about reskilling is, you know, one of the fun, quick exercises you can do, read is to, you know, anybody tells you, oh, we're doing reskilling, right? The next question you want to ask is, okay, so how many people? And what you tip typically find that it's been very hard to do reskilling at scale. So people may say we reskilled a hundred people, maybe a thousand people, but the, the scale of the reskilling that's going to be required over the next decade or two is actually in the millions. And we have, so that's a thing. That, so you've got the, those kinds of issues. The other issues that we have are the, wage effects. And let me go into a little bit of detail on this one. We've seen this play out in, 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 in the real world. So the good thing is that I think technologists are correct when we say, uh, you know, these AI technologies are going to complement as opposed to replace people. That's generally true. But that often can have both positive and adverse wage effects in the following sense. So for example, imagine a technology that complements you read or compliments me or compliments a radiologist. That actually is great. It makes you and I and the radiologist way more productive and everybody benefits. We are more productive. We earn more money. The outcomes are good for everybody. People get the benefit of our outputs. So it works all out. It works out. That's great. But look at the other end. When you complement, for example, uh, uh, some more basic occupations, in some cases, the technology is actually complementing and doing the value added portion of that work. And what's left over for the human, maybe the less differentiated aspect of that work. And what happens as an economic question is that, you know, what you've just done is expanded the labor pool available for doing that, right? So in other words, you know, the classic example is the London black cab example where decades ago, you know, in London to be a black cab driver, you had to literally memorize the map of London. And there's a test called the knowledge, knowledge. the <laughs> knowledge. Exactly. You have to pass that. And there've been some very good studies that have actually shown that with the advent of GPS systems, for example, it literally took away uh, and had an impact on the wages because all you now needed to do to be a really good driver in London and just know how to drive because the GPS would solve the knowledge part of it. 
And so what that does is it expands the labor pool available and in fact can have a depressive effect on wages. So, so we have to think about these wage effects and that's typically which then takes you to the sometimes the UBI conversation because what happens is it's a recognition that on the one hand, we're creating, as I suggested at the beginning, enormous economic potential. So if we're gonna create all this abundance economically, and yet we may have these adverse wage effects or, right, or worse, shouldn't we be somehow creating a way for people to generate income? That's where the wage, the UBI question typically comes from. Now, personally, I, I, I'm not a proponent of UBI, but I like the UBI discussion in the following sense, because it, it's getting at a real question, which is what happens when we're creating economic surpluses and yet wages are not going up as much for everybody? What do we do about that? So I like the, I like the UBI question for the debate it provokes about the wage effects, which by the way, are already here. So one of the things we, you know, we've learned from the California Future Work Commission and other studies across the country is that we already know there's inequality. We know that uh, uh, technology is one of multiple factors contributing to that. So the immediate question we're gonna to need to deal with is not are we gonna have any jobs, but are the jobs gonna pay enough? And that's a very real question you see in all these commissions across the country and other countries, especially in the advanced economies. It's a real question. Yep. And clearly we're already facing some of the things on that. Although I think, you know, personally, and I'd be curious your point of view, most of the things that when people are saying are currently um, wage effects of automation or more wage effects of globalization, um, the automation is still very much coming and is important to focus on, but it's like, oh, well, the robots are taking your jobs. Like, well, I'm not sure actually if the question is yet is the robots are taking your jobs as much as as um, can the robots get here soon enough to empower higher wager jobs? And can we get the higher wage jobs part of it is the, is, is I think the more, the more relevant part. What do you yeah, think? No, I, 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 th I think that's right. I think the, the globalization and jobs and wage question was a legitimate and real question. If you looked at the late nineties, early two thousands, because that was in fact, you know, the driver of some of the wage effects we saw at that time. But I think that 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 trend is going away because we know that uh, pretty much everywhere, including in places like China and others, were, which were playing the labor arbitrage game, uh, the wages are going up there too. Uh, and so the 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 dynamic going forward is less on wages, is less about globalization. By the way, if you looked at, if you go through and uh, typically, you know the the. Globalization wage question plays out often in, in manufacturing and other service sector jobs. And what happens there, if you looked at now, the only places where you still have some extraordinary labor arbitrage uh, uh, going on tends to be in a few narrow parts of manufacturing, typically furniture manufacturing, uh, some portions of textiles. It's not everywhere. Uh, large parts of the manufacturing sector, which include automotive, uh, you know, chemicals, etc. that effect is not really at play anymore. So the, on a forward looking basis, I don't think the debate on wages is about globalization. It's about the structure of the economy. We know that, uh, you know, when you have an economy that is sector service sector dominated, which most advanced economies are, ours certainly is, the wage question is very, is very real. I mean, people, you know, manu we can talk about manufacturing all we want, Today, manufacturing is eight, no, sorry, nine percent of the U.S. labor force. It's not the dominant piece. The rest of it is everything else, including the service sector economy. The last time manufacturing was a big part of the economy was 1958. Was the peak of it. It's been coming down ever since. Uh huh. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Although obviously the classic problem is the service economy absorbs a lot of people in terms of number of jobs, but they only get the leverage to get the wages up on that is actually in fact an interesting challenge. That is correct. Uh, that is correct. And, and by the way, you know, I'm, I'm kind of being somewhat flippant about manufacturing its size and scale. One of the nice things about having a manufacturing sector, it has these multiplier effects around it. So we know that when there's manufacturing activity going on, the multiplier effects on adjacent services is actually a positive one. So there is a need to actually have manufacturing, not that everybody's going to work in manufacturing, because I don't think that's going to happen. 
uh, but it, it has these wonderful multiplier effects. But but you're right. That's the question, which is how you know how do we think about wages and income in a service sector driven economy? Uh, you know, our portions yep. of the service sector are you know the lucky ones. The rest looks like people who work in restaurants, people who work in uh, you know, services, et cetera, the wage structures of that, of that are quite different. Yep. Um, quick reminder for our audience, uh, you can ask questions in the chat. Um, we're, you know, kind of two thirds of the way through. Um, so as, as questions come in, I will integrate them into this discourse. James and I have been talking to each other for a long time. So I have hours and hours of questions for James. So I, I will keep going, but I, but I am interruptible with uh, questions coming in for, for things that have a particular interest. Um, let's shift to artificial general intelligence now. So as you're doing in Daedalus and, and as you know, we have a, a wide variety of AI researchers, some who are like, uh, look, we've got fundamental things, the things that you gestured at before, you know, everything from um, symbolic reasoning to, you know, kind of language, uh, you know, uh, one shot learning, a uh, transfer learning, et cetera as like, no, no, these things have not been, you know, we have fundamental innovations coming. We have other folks saying, no, actually, in fact, the scale of these language models um, or the foundational models, um, you know, together with some other innovations will actually, in fact, make this stuff work. Um, and so, um, you know, these are the things that are kind of playing into this. And so um, what, what are some of the observations you might share with our community today, our group on, on kind of how to think about AGI soon, possibilities, probabilities, constraints? Yeah, so, so first of all, just to start with large language models. I mean, first of all, you know, these have been remarkable. I mean, I think with the starting with the advent of, uh, you know, that classic transformer paper uh, that Vaswani and others at, uh, at Google did about three, three, three and a half years ago, that has led to these, you know, the, you know, everybody's building a large language model now. I mean, Google's built, you know, went from BERT and now there's Lambda. OpenAI's gone, went from GPT-1, 2, and 3, and there's more to come. And Microsoft is building, you know, you know, you know MTNLG and DeepMind has built Gopher. So there's, there's just bigger and bigger models being built. Uh, the performance not entirely seems to improve with size. Uh, but, you know, there may be some limits to that. So, and what's, what's, what's remarkable about large language models, as you know, Reed, is the fact that they've also been able to have these multimodal outputs. So you can go from natural language, yes, to natural language outputs, but also do natural language to software code. Uh, Microsoft and OpenAI did this, you know, went from, you know, GPT-3 to Codex, which generated software code. You can do, co you know, natural language to images. It's, so. So that's what's often led to people to start to think about them as foundational models. So the question is, and you know, are those a way to get to things that start to look like general intelligence? So I think people working in deep learning, people working in reinforcement, by the way, reinforcement learning is what, you know, what you've seen DeepMind and others uh, in OpenAI do quite a bit. DeepMind is taking it to do, you know, all the alphas, right? Alpha zero, alpha fold, in doing such to do science, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what people generally conclude is that these approaches still have a lot of headway, a lot of headroom. There's still a lot more. We have not reached the limits of these techniques yet and these approaches, and we're going to see many more innovations. But you come back to this question of, is that enough? I, I, I happen to think that that may not be enough, actually, because you know, there's still some really hard problems about causal reasoning and meaning and understanding <laughs> about, you know, are we actually building in understanding and generating understanding? Uh, we, we still have a hard time doing science. Uh, you know, we still have a hard time, for example, generating systems that create kind of novelty or conjectures, say in mathematics, for example, although there's a fun recent paper on knots uh, on knot theory and topology that uh, came out of DeepMind, which is kind of fascinating. But these are still very hard questions, questions about memory and persistence. Uh, we don't quite know how to do that. In fact, uh, many still think that there's a lot more we can learn from neuroscience that we haven't fully mined uh, what we can learn from neuroscience about cognitive agents and models and how that works. 
So I, I, you know, to declare my own biases, I, I tend to, be, I think, in the camp of we need more. <laughs> we need more uh, conceptual breakthroughs, I think, before we get to AGI. But, but at the same time, I think we're going to get a lot more out of these systems that we're building today. The question is, uh, you know, at what point uh, should we start to prepare for the possibility of AGI? And I don't think we need to go all the way to AGI before we start to have systems where we need to be thinking about the implications. I think it's one of the key questions, quite frankly, for the field, which is, you know, how do we prepare for that? How do we coordinate? I think one of the amazing things that has happened is that the players and the researchers at the forefront of all these developments, uh, uh, you know, are the good folks uh, so far. I think with the best intentions, of course, they compete intensely, but I think they're all trying to want the best for society. I think they've, they've written this into their missions, et cetera. That's good. But I think that may not always be the case. I mean, these systems can become so powerful. And so we need to start to think about how do we approach questions about safety? How do we think about questions of control, questions of human alignment? Stuart Russell has been, you know, uh, Professor Berkeley, uh, you, you've read his book and others may, may have read it or find it interesting, uh, is on human compatible AI. This is a question of how do we build provably beneficial systems that are roughly aligned with our interests and what's best for us? And this is a very hard, both technical scientific question, but quite frankly, societal question. Uh, so I think these are some of the hard questions, but, you know, as I said, I'm of the view, Reed, that I think we need more. Hmm. I look, so I just completely deep agree. Yep. Um, and also, I think, um, I think even the most sophisticated people in deep learning think that there needs to be some more too. The real question is it this much more or this much more, like how many innovations right. is it in order to get there? Um, one of the things that you gestured at very importantly at the very beginning of our of our discussion today is that it is going to be essential to build and maintain public trust um, because these systems are going to have a huge impact on people's lives uh, the economic system jobs wages um, there's a variety of places where they can intervene um, what are some of the things do you think we as technologists and we as tech companies because one of the weirdnesses in the public trust is this is going to be in current, if you look at the current activity, it's all massively being draw, driven by corporations. Um, you know, actually, fact, frankly, both within the US and within China and other places, all corporations. And obviously, um, there's some worries about corporations doing this. There's profit motives. There's, um, you know, some, some societal questions that are more urgent to society and individuals than they are to corporations. Uh, fairness, for example, might be one of the things that people would worry about. What are some of the ways that we as technologists not only should be thinking about it, but engaging in public dialogue and, 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 and doing things that would help build and maintain uh, or even rebuild and maintain, because I don't think public trust is at a current high watermark uh, in, order to, in order to be doing that? Yeah, and, and, and this is a very hard question, Reed. Um, and I think it's it's actually one of the things that's uh, complicated about by about AI compared to other technology, which is you know it is being led primarily by the private sector, as you said. I, I think a few things come to mind. I think one is the sector itself. I think has to be more transparent uh, about how it's doing what it's doing, and I think actually the public would actually be quite pleased. And one of the things that I always find interesting, and this is even before my role at, at, at Google, uh, it, it has always struck me that when you spend time with the people actually building these systems in the current, in the current leaders of these, who are developing these systems, pick any one of them. They're actually very thoughtful about what they're doing. And they can debate about is this approach better? Is it approach? But they, they're, you find that they actually care about the ethical implications. They may just be debating how to achieve them. But much of what they're doing is not as available and transparent to the public, right? People don't know that these discussions are happening, these debates are happening, these issues are happening. So they, they assume that it's all entirely driven by the profit motive. Uh, and that's not true. So I think there's just something about 
more transparency, which actually would show that a lot of thought is going into these systems. That's one. The, the other is, I think, uh, you know, some involvement by the tech sector and the developers with uh, policymakers and regulators. I mean, I'm always surprised by how little understanding there is in, in regulatory policymaking circles about how these systems work. Uh, you know, you don't just have to listen to hearings you see on C-SPAN and others to see, oh my goodness, they, they really don't understand this stuff. So I think there's just something about the continual education, involvement and engagement with policymakers so that all of us and people who are going to be making decisions about these systems uh, understand them. I do also think that there's some place, quite frankly, for, uh, you know, uh, some peer pressure and uh, uh, peer group pressure and systems. One of the things I was quite pleased about a couple of a few years ago was when, uh, you know, the partnership on AI was created, which is intended to be a peer group of leading companies who are leading research in AI coming together, trying to establish their own set of standards. I think here there's a lot to be learned, by the way, from what happened in genomics and biology. Uh, there's a famous Asilomar Symposium, uh, 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 you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s that actually created a, a peer set of rules and principles about how to do uh, genomics research uh, that have largely held and I know you've been a part of this, Reid. I mean, the, the, this ecosystem has attempted to do those things. I think we need more of those kinds of things. Uh, but even that won't be enough. I think in the end, uh, we may need some clearer, clearer rules of the road. Uh, we may need uh, to do that in a global sense because it's not just you know about the U.S. and about Silicon Valley. Uh, these systems are being built everywhere. I think that's what was a little bit complicating because you've got a few different competing things going on at the global stage. One are the purely economic stakes. And the economic stakes, by the way, are not just for, for companies, but they're for countries too. Right? So the economic states, stakes affect countries and companies. Then you've got the national security stakes. I mean, you and I were on this task force uh, on innovation and national security. And you could see the tensions on that task force, right? You've got innovators and economists on the one hand saying, oh, but this is good for society and the economy, and, right? And then people coming out of a national security background by saying, but no, 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 this might not be as good for our national interest. So the question is, how do we navigate uh, those tensions? And I think one of the key differences between AI and other technologies that have had national security implications like, I don't know, uh, nuclear uh, science, for example, is that, unlike, you know, the nice thing about nuclear science is that, you know, at the, you know, the governments typically lead in that. And, mm -hmm. and so there's an alignment that it's governments who've largely led in that work in the, in the nuclear age in the Cold War, and all the capabilities are on the government side. So you had an aligned center of interest. And the nice thing about nuclear technology, by the way, is that if somebody uses it, we can detect it. AI is a little bit different in the sense that on the one hand, all the innovations are in the private sector. The private sector is thinking about global economic opportunities, not just national uh, questions. And so you've got that dissonance. The other dissonance you've got is the detectability accountability question is much harder with AI systems in a way that it isn't with say biological weapons or nuclear weapons. So this is a much more complicated arena uh, and there's a lot to think about. Yep, we have a question from one of my uh, favorite people from the audience, uh, Selena Tabakawala, um, which is, I think, a classic and important question here and applies across a wide variety of fields. Um, this one in particular, you know, you say, well, sexism, the bias and the algorithms data, how much of it is just better measurement and validation? And how much of it is the people doing the work um, who will have a natural uh, kind of validation, cross check, understanding about whether or not they're on track or not? What do you think the, the, these components need to be in order to, to uh, improve um, uh, kind of our, uh, you know, kind of alignment and the outcome of these algorithms? How much, how, what's the balance and play between these? Uh, I think you need both. Uh, and I would actually add a couple more. When I say both, I think the, you know, the making sure we diversify the people involved in the development and questioning of these systems and here, diversity is important, not just in the 
gender or racial ethnicity sense, but also just in the disciplinary sense, because you find that sometimes social scientists ask different kinds of questions, actually. Uh, ethicists will ask different kinds of questions. So I think uh, the question is correct. I think there's something about the, the diversifying the, the, the people involved in the development of these systems. I also think that there's, there's also the other part, which is uh, better thinking and curation of how we train these algorithms. That comes down to the data question, quite frankly, and how society collects, aggregates the data. But even there, I'd also add, you know, the technology itself can help too, right? So on the data front, I'd say, we need to solve for society, how society collects this data, as in the policing example, for example. But we also need to think about, can AI itself actually help us spot those things, spot those patterns? So in other words, AI can actually be a tool to spot bias, actually. In fact, you're starting to see examples of systems that try to do that, uh, particularly with toxic outputs, for example. One of the nice things that some of the latest large language models do is they do almost, they're trying to do their own pre-checking of their outputs using almost adversarial different other large language models to do that. So the AI itself can be a tool for that. I think we're going to need all these components. Now, how much you put weight on one of those elements versus the other, I think it's very arena dependent. In the work that we're doing for the National Academies, how you think about that question in, in commercial environments where you've got market forces at work is very different than how you might think about it, for example, in, in health and safety sensitive arenas like in healthcare or transportation systems, for example. So I think there's something about tailoring the mix of those things to the different uh, settings and arenas, uh, but you need all of them, I think. Yep. Well, we have time for one uh, last quick fun question uh, since we've gone through these very, very serious issues. Um, James, you're, um, I always recommend everything you write and everything you do because it's balanced and thoughtful and brings in considerations and is erudite and, and has depth of a combination of scholarship, but also understanding Thank and you. pragmatism and usefulness. What things would you recommend to this audience about like what stood out for you lately? Books, podcasts, movies. What would you recommend? Masters of right. scale. Masters of scale. No, no, I wasn't looking for that one. <laughs> right. No, 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 but Thank it's you. true, right? <laughs> yes. It's true. Um, gosh, I mean, I, th I think in terms of, you know, to the, you know, around the topics that we're talking about, I actually think your audience might find this collection of Daedalus interesting when it comes out, because partly mm. because it's an amazing group of people writing it and they have very different views, by the way, and you will see the debates when you read it. That's one. I also think that uh, there's a there's a wonderful book that um, uh, Eric Schmidt and Henry Kissinger have put together and Dan Hartenlocker, mm -hmm. uh, which tries to get at some of these geopolitical questions. That's actually worth uh, reading. Um, and it gets a lot of the issues. And quite frankly, there's some really good papers. I mean, one of the nice things about the AI field is that uh, even the technical researchers have actually started to write good, you know, approachable, readable papers. Uh, so I often think for anybody listening interested in deep learning, the the, uh, the paper that was written last year by uh, Joshua Bengio, uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, and Jan LeCun, who are kind of seen as, I mean, as you know, the three of them won the Turing Award for their work in deep learning. They were kind of taking stock at uh, deep learning, where the field, where that particular set of approaches stands, and what more needs to be done, it's actually a very good and uh, very readable paper. So there's a bunch of things like that read that I that I think are interesting. Hundred percent. So uh, that brings us to the end of our discussion, James. Thank you for being with us today. As always, I would do. I'll take this show on the road any day, as you know. <laughs> right. Well, um, thank you. you. You and I still have a lot to debate and argue about with all these things. So <laughs> we, we will we will be doing more in a variety of circumstances, and um, you know, uh, I think everyone has seen. We've had a lot of people logged in. A lot of our uh, treasured members of our Greylock community here. Uh, because they are looking for expertise and insight such as the one you provide. And we appreciate you spending this really valuable time with us. Um, thank you also to our audience. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's uh, conversations. Please keep an eye out for an email survey about this event. We're always looking for ways to improve. And we hope to see you again at our next session in a couple of weeks. Greylock's talent partner, Holly Rose Faith, will be interviewing Michelle Zaitlin of Cloudflare. 
Thank you again, James. Uh, as always, erudite, insightful, comprehensive, and deep. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thanks for having me, Reed.